about text mining R, so we have to record it uh, for future use and as a material for future. So please, uh, if you're not comfortable with Sluvia Shade, feel free to just use a dummy name so that your name doesn't appear uh, on this recording. It is. So uh, Shelmith Macharia. So Shelmith is a data scientist at Ajua, uh, which is previously known as MSurvey. Ajua is an integrated customer experience company that connects business to customers in real time. Uh, Shelmith holds a BSc in statistics from the University of Nairobi. She is currently finalizing her MSc in biometry from the University of Nairobi. So we are really glad to have you, Shelmith. Thank you uh, for this. Um, and part of our job is that data science, as I've said in Ajua, is customer experience, which means you get a lot of text data coming in, messages, you've been asked to give a review of a hotel, and then you just write a long sentence or paragraph. So it's actually her job to actually mine that data and know what your experience was uh, uh, from the data that you've sent in or from the message that you've sent in. So that's why she, she has a experience in text mining. And we're really glad that uh, you'll be taking us through this session. So welcome, Shelmi. So I am going to stop sharing my screen so that uh, we can start sharing. Okay, thank you so much, Faith, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so I'll go ahead and share my screen and we we'll get started. So, uh, uh, sorry, just a uh, mini Shelmith. So the code that you are using today, uh, that Shelmith is going to go through, uh, we have uploaded that in GitHub. So uh, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, let me reshare the link to GitHub. So just go there, clone, or download the zip, zip file, and then uh, you can go through the, the exercises and the session with her using the code. Thank you. Go on, Shelmith, sorry. Okay, thank you so much, Faith. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, please confirm. Yes, yes, yes. sure, we can. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so as Faith said, my name is Shelmit. Um, um, I work at Ajua. I've been in Ajua for the last two years. And Ajua, uh, is an integrated customer experience company. What we do is we connect businesses to customers. Um, just to give you some context, if you've uh, been to Java before and you paid via M-Pesa, you always get a text asking you to read your experience. And the survey is based on a metric we call Net Promoter Score, where you give a score and a comment. So that's the data we get. So uh, we have software that powers that, so we send the service in real time and collect the data in real time. Then uh, the data we get is populated into a CSV file, and we from there we do a lot of analysis, analytics, machine learning, and so on. Yeah, so uh, I have experience with text data for uh, two years now, and from what I'm hearing, people have a perception that text mining is difficult. <laughs> There's a fear that people have. And from my view, I think a text mining is easier than the normal analysis with numeric data. Uh, we'll see that, but it's up to you. To, you'll tell me maybe at the end of this session. Uh, so I'll try to make it as basic as possible so that we get the concepts. Uh, yeah. So. Um, so today we will, we will explore text mining using tidy data principles. So there are so many ways of ex doing text mining. So we have a number of packages in R that are able to do text mining. Uh, we have Quantida package. Um, so you can go and look at uh, how to do text mining with Quantida package after this. Um, we also have uh, TM package, TM meaning text mining package. And we have a tidy approach where we use the tidy text package. So today we'll be using the tidy data principles for text mining using the tidy, the, 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 I mean the tidy text package. And the reason why we are using tidy text packages, uh, what it does, it, it, it cleans data in such a way that 
it's easier to work with other data manipulation verbs like dplyr, ggplot2. Yeah, so we will, so in this training, we use the, the tidy data principles and we will cover the following. So we learn how to read text data. Uh, we learn how to tidy text data. This will take some time. Uh, as we know, tidying data takes more time. Then we'll do some visualization uh, using ggplot2 and word clouds. Uh, we're also going to learn a statistic that is used in text mining. It's called term frequency inverse document frequency. Uh, so this statistic is used to identify important words in documents. Documents, in this case, I, I, I mean speeches, text data, and so on. And then you're also going to do sent sentiment analysis, and then we'll have an opportunity to practice uh, these concepts. So I'm using R Markdown, uh, the one that you're seeing. So R Markdown, I believe, has been introduced in previous sessions. Um, is uh, a Markdown, I mean, it's an R, uh, um, an R file that enables us to, uh, you know, need to get reports of various types. We can get HTML reports, PDF reports, Word documents. And what we do is, uh, once you have your R Markdown, you need, you can need to HTML to PDF to Word. So in my case, I'll be needing to HTML. So let me just do that. So once you need, it runs. And we should... I, 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 shall. I sorry for interrupting you. So we have a participant who says the blue background is blinding them. So they're oh, requesting okay. you to change that to black or white, or black and white, yeah, if possible. Uh, okay. Thank you, Vera. Okay, thank you. Thank also, you feel that. free. Uh, sorry, feel free to ask any questions on the chat or comment or any concerns like that, and then we're going to address them. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, thank you so much. So I'm going to change the the appearance to black. So, so this is how you change it. You go to tools, um, global options, then appearance. Then you have a lot. You have a list of themes. So. Uh, let me see which one. Uh, okay, let me go with this one. Then you say okay. And yeah, I hope this is better. Vera, is this uh, background okay? Maybe you can also try and enlarge your, your words. Uh, no? Vera, can, can you see can you see the the chat? Uh, sorry, the art studio now better. I think Vera is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay now. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So the text is okay too, I believe. The text size, I mean. Uh, So, yeah, so I've just, um, so I've just needed my, my L markdown file to a HTML report that you see here. So the report looks nice. So this is one of the, uh, the advantages of using R markdown. You're able to generate reports that you can share with um, with maybe your colleagues, uh, your classmates, yeah. Okay, so I'll hide that for now. So today we'll just use the console. Um, so I believe the, the, the link to the uh, files on GitHub has been shared. So those of you that have Git uh, installed and set up on RStudio, you can clone directly from the terminal. Uh, you just say, so, just come and say git clone, and then the, the URL in quotes, and then you run, it should clone. So cloning is downloading that, um, that file from 
GitHub to EC, and then you should be able to run. Number two, I'm using a project. So you notice on my uh, top right, project you're calling text. And I'm using a project because one, it's very easy to work with projects because once when you are on, when you're using projects, you see all your files um, in that folder um, listed here. And also you don't have to set a working directory because you've already told R that um, the, the data set you need is in that, uh, in that folder, unless you're reading a data, the data set from another folder, okay? So how do you, for those of you that have not, uh, that do not have projects, how do you uh, set up projects? So you just go here, click on this drop down icon, um, and then you click on new project. Uh, just a minute, I'll get back. Then you click on create project. So this, this, uh, this, this function here uh, helps you create a new project. So you specify the, the directory name. So you can call it um, text my name. Then create project as a direct subdirectory of, so that's the folder where you want it to be. So maybe you want it to be in documents. So you can click on documents and then you say create project and it should open a, a new project for you. Okay, so you can also create from an existing uh, folder, uh, okay. an, exi an existing directory, that is a folder that has data and R codes. So you just select which one it is, then you say create project, it should do that for you. Then I mentioned uh, GitHub. Um, so we also have an option for creating a project and linking it to GitHub. You use this version control. Um, then create a, a project from version control. You click on Git, then you clone. So the URL on your GitHub, that's what you put here. And then you choose where to save, to save on your PC. Then you say create project. So I can share a link on how to set up uh, Git on our studio for those of you that haven't uh, after the session. Okay, so so we'll get started now. Um, so the first thing we do is, as a good programming practice, is to clear our memory. That is to remove everything that is in our environment before we start. So you notice that I already have objects on my environment here. And so the first thing I'll do is clear them. So I run this code that removes everything. So when running chunks, we click on this green uh, icon here, and then it runs the chunk. And you notice that my environment has been cleared. Again, I forgot to mention, I know my, my R Studio layout looks a bit different. So what I've done is I've just switched. More normally, the console is down here. So I've just switched here to this. Uh, this side then the environment is here and you can do that again from tools uh, you just go to global options uh, pane layout and you can select um, where you want to have your different windows like you could choose to have your environment there the it update if i choose to have my environment there then my environment will be on my top right yeah so yeah so, okay, so there are packages that were, you were asked to, to install uh, before coming to the, for this session. So I believe it was TidyText, Tidyverse, and WordCloud. I'd also ask uh, you guys to install topic models, but we won't use that today uh, because of time. Again, I also want to make this as basic as possible. There are extra packages that you need to install uh, for this session. And they are listed here. So we have tidy text, I mean read text, read extra, PDF tools, and uh, text data. So in case you don't have them installed, um, you install them using this function, install.packages. Then you, you put the package there in quotes. Uh, for instance, I can try to install read text. So you should have your internet, con you should have internet connectivity. Uh, 
giving me an error because it's already installed. Yeah, so you should have internet connectivity, so it, it installs for you. Then once you install, you load the package using the require function or the library function. So they perform the same task. You can say require it text and it should call that package. Now, if you have so many packages to install, you don't need to install one by one. As if you go to, you say install.packages, read text, then you say install.packages, word cloud. No, you don't need to do that. So R yeah, has a function. Um, I mean, you can, you can put the packages in a string, um, in a vector using the concatenate function, as you can see here. Uh, and then, you run the, the, and then you run that function, should install all of them. Over here, you also see dependencies equals true. So what this means is there are some packages that depend on other packages to work. So when you say dependencies is true, it means install other packages that might be required for these packages to work. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, once you have your packages, the next step is the data. For this session, we will be using the presidential speeches on COVID-19 since March 2020. Uh, we'll try to uh, get insights from those, um, from those speeches without reading them. Um, so the next step now is how to read uh, text data. And there are various ways of reading text data. One, you can go to your website and copy paste a piece of text and, and then you, you put it in a vector um, inside the, 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 as a string uh, using the concatenate function and then run. So this is one of the, this is a short uh, a paragraph of one of the speeches that I just picked and pasted here. So when you run this, it should read as read. So when we call that object, you can see it has been read, and and it's read. Um, it's it's a this is a vector, and it's of class char character. So when we get the class of this um, this data. You see it's of class character. So that's one way of reading. The other way of reading is, uh, so when you, you, when you are copy pasting into R, sometimes it's not effective and the code doesn't look neat, especially when you have such a long, you know, you have long text. So what you can do is uh, copy that data and put it maybe on a text file or a word file or a PDF file or an Excel file. Yeah, and then you can read uh, the, the file. Yeah, so you can read a text file. So there are functions for reading different types of files, like reading text files. You can use, <coughs> excuse me, the read.delim function. Then you specify the, the folder, um, the, I mean the path and the name of the file, and the .txt, it means it's a text file, and the separator is the tab function. You can also use the read.table. It does the same thing. So um, one of my data sets is, I'm trying to open the data set. Yeah, so one of my data set is match.txt. You can see here. So I'm going to read using that function. Let's see. So I run that code and call that object and you can see it has been read yeah again if you use the read.table function it should also read uh, okay some warnings so when you call that object you see it has been read. So if I wanted to read a PDF file, 
I would have to use a function and load a library uh, PDF tools, yeah, and then use this function to read the PDF uh, file. Okay, so we can read that. Oh, okay. So, hmm. so I need to load the library. Let's just load all of them. Yeah, so you see it has been read. And once you read the files, you see them here. So some are character, uh, uh, are vectors like data and data PDF. Uh, some are data frames like data te underscore text and data underscore txt2. So if I was to read a word file, I would have to use another function. So this is not very efficient, especially um, when you have files of different types uh, or when you have many files to read, you can't use this function. You, you keep reading the files one by one. So R has a package that makes it easy to read text files and the package, not text, file, yeah, text files, and the package is read text package. So this package um, is able to, is used for importing and handling plain and formatted files. And it's able to, to read different file types. Like it can read, it can read text files, CSV files, JSON files, Word documents, PDF files. Uh, it's also able to read multiple files uh, at once. And it can read files of uh, different file types. So we are going to see uh, how it reads uh, different files. So we start by reading one file. Um, so one of the files we have is a Word document, june.docs. So we are going to read that. So the function is read text. Then you specify your, your path and the file name with the extension. So because we are reading one file, so um, the folder is features because remember uh, our, our project is text mining and features is a folder within text mining. So we have to specify that, that it knows that the data is in this folder. Then the name of the file is June and it's a word file. So when we run that, you see it has been read here and it has been read as a data frame with two columns. One is document ID and the other one is the text. So what if you wanted to read, uh, let's say, uh, the PDF file? So we'll just change, uh, we just update the name to May 1 and then change the extension to PDF. And when we run that, you see, it has been read. The same case would apply to a TXT file. Just change the name and the extension and it's read, it reads. So that is that makes it very easy to read uh, files of different types. And number two, we said it can read multiple text files. So what if uh, we wanted to read all the text files in this folder? Um, so we would use the same function, uh, specify the path, and then we'll have an asterisk. The asterisk means all, then all dot word files or all dot txt files. Okay. So let's try and read all the word documents in this uh, in this folder. So I've already specified I want to read all the word files. So when I run that, it reads june.docs because it's the only word file in our folder. Um, if I wanted to read all the txt files, I'd change the extension to txt. And when I run it, you can see that um, it has read all the txt files. Okay. Uh, I'll do the same if I wanted to read the PDF files, just change um, the extension to the PDF and yeah, it reads the, the PDF files, it's only one. Okay, so it can also read 
multiple files of all types. So you can read all these files at once. And the function is here. So you use read text. But now after this slash function, you don't specify the, the extension. So this tells R, uh, please read all the files uh, in this folder. So when we run this, it reads all these files. There are 10, there are 10 files and you can see it has read 10 files. So that's how you read your text data. So the other option you can uh, use is read, you can read directly from the website uh, using the URL, uh, but I won't discuss that. Yeah, so you can go and explore later. Yeah, so now we have our data. Um, the data has been loaded. And again, I read text. Read text uh, reads the data as a data frame. So we, we get the class of this um, data set that we just loaded. Um, you can see it's a data frame. Yeah, so it makes it easier for us to, uh, to do our, our tidying and our more fitting. Yeah, so and it also it also um, has a column that specifies uh, from what document the text is from. So you're able to know where where, where that text is from. So now we have our data loaded. Um, I don't know if we have any questions until that point. Um, uh, I can't see any questions as of now. Uh, but there's a, a small delay in your words and your actions. I think it's through internet, but kindly just bear with us. Uh, just continue, show me. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. So now we have our data in R. Um, so the next step is to clean the data. Okay. So when you think about um, cleaning data. First, when we think about tidy data, we in uh, reference to numeric data, clean data is, okay, or rather tidy data is data that is populated in a table where the, the columns uh, are the variables and the rows are the observations. And each, um, each cell, the row and the column has one observation. Now, what, what is tidy text data in our case? So tidy text data, is it data that has this kind of data? Is it this kind of data? It looks tidy, is it? No, so tidy text data is data that has one observation per row. So by that we mean um, like this, this, this text data here from april.txt. So we'd have one word per, per row. So we'd have april.txt fellow. Uh, another uh, row say Kenya all those words are put in one column and we have one word per row. So uh, the tidy package um, has a, a nice function with, uh, called a nest underscore tokens that converts the data into the tidy format I just talked about. So this function, uh, so first the process of uh, putting data in to one option per row is called tokenization. So a token is one word, yeah? So a nesting is like remove, you know, moving from that nest. So we are, we, are, we are, you know, putting them into one column and one word per, per row. And the nest fun, uh, tokens function has two advantages. One, it removes the punctuation for us. So as it unnests the tokens, it removes all the punctuation. So you don't, you don't have to worry about that. Um, number two, it also converts all words to lowercase for uniformity. It makes it easy for us to work with um, the words because they are uniform. And in case you had other columns, like in our case, we had this one, uh, doc underscore ID, it will retain this column. And in case we had other columns, it will still retain them. And then you'll have uh, one, in, the, in this column, you'll have uh, one word uh, per row, yeah? And so once we do that, then we, we can, we can uh, you can do a frequency table to see the most common words. 
And as is expected in any piece of text, you would see a lot of uh, what I'd call stop words, uh, words that are very common in a data set, but are not uh, meaningful. Words like because, will, excuse me, shall, is, of, such words. So we will uh, type text um, package as a function for removing those stop words um, so that we are left with meaningful words. Um, yeah, so after that, we can also visualize and see now which are the most common words now without the stop words. And then we'll also remove numbers and funny symbols from the data. We will uh, use, uh, make use of functions like grepol, gsub, string detect. Yeah, and I have to say at this point that tidy text works well with um, data frames. So I will, we will using a, a special kind of a data frame we call a tibol. A tibol is um, a neat data frame. So if you have a data, normally when you have a data frame and you, you call that data frame, you see all the columns are listed there. Now a tibol just lists the first 10 uh, not columns, I mean rows, the first 10 and it's, it's, it looks tidy and it's also, it also makes it easier to work with other data manipulation verbs. So uh, let's see. Uh, so you remember this data set here, the one I just copied from the website, uh, it's labeled data. So you remember it was of class, um, it was a vector. So we need first to convert it to a data frame. And then we will um, unnest the tokens. And then we remove stop words. And then we will do a, a count of the words to see what are the most common words. So I'm going to run that. So um, I said we will use a tibol. So I'll use the function tibol. So um, tibol is is contained within the, the package deplier, not deplier, the package tibol, sorry. Um, so there's, and for me, it, it runs with, uh, when I've just loaded tidyverse, it's also within the deplier package. So if it doesn't run, please call package tibol. Um, yeah, so uh, let me see what happens. Installed. Yeah, Tibol is installed. Uh, so you can update here. You need to install. Sometimes, um, if you have Tibol, uh, if you have loaded Tibol, sometimes it doesn't read. So if it doesn't, if it doesn't read and you have Tibol, please remove it and see if it runs. If if it doesn't read, read and you don't have Tibol, please load that like that. So let me add it there. Uh, so yeah, so now we will go, uh, we will convert our, our data, the vector, the one that is in vector form into a tibol, and this is the function. So it says tibol. Um, line equals one is the function to, it keeps track of what line that text is from. So, um, with a call data. Yeah, you can see we only have one line here, one line of text. Uh, so it's reading from that line. And then text, text is the new column that we are going to have, and it's obtained from data. So when we run that, um, call data four. You see now the, the, the data now is a tibol uh, and it shows the line from which um, the, the text is from and now the text. Yeah. So now that in tibol we can now go ahead and use the tidy text principles uh, and nest tokens and remove stop words. Uh, first I'm using this operator here. It's called the pipe operator and it's, it's from the deplier package uh, contained within the verbs. 
and it helps us. It, it just says take data for, then do this, then so it's for continuity. Yeah, it also helps us organize our code well without having to write so many lines of code. Yeah, so I'm going to take um, data four, uh, assign it to an object data five, then I'm going to a nest token. So I'll run this line by line so that we get the concept. So remember that this is how data four looks like. So you want to nest tokens and have uh, one, one, one word per row. So we use the unnest tokens function and it is um, unnest the text into a column we call word. So when I run that and call that data set, you can now see that the, the text has now been put into a tidy text structure where we have one word per row. You can see fellow Kenyans today, the 16th of what, what, yeah. So at this point, we can also visualize to see what are the most common words in this, um, in this data set. So we will use the count function. So take data for and nest tokens, then count the words and arrange them uh, in order of the most, the one with the highest frequency. So when we run this and call five, you see it has listed the words and the frequency, the number of times they appear in that, um, that document. And you see there is the most common word with 22 entries and it's the second common word with eight entries of so most of these words you're seeing here are what, <coughs> excuse me, what I was referring to stop words. Words that are very common but don't tell us much. Yeah. So if you look at the words that come last, so a table shows you the first 10 columns. So we can view the last 10 rows, sorry, using a function we call tail. So this highlights the last six, um, the last six rows of that data set. Uh, run that when we see the last six words are transmitted virus was well within so the words um, that matter are now you know being uh, counted as being we are seeing those words as the ones that appear less frequently so we need to remove these words so that we 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 see the most useful words and we will use the uh, the we will we'll use the anti-join function. So before I get there, um, R has a dictionary, uh, tidy text has a dictionary of stop words, a list of stop words. It's contained within the tidy text package. So if I call um, that data set, you can see, um, you can see the words and they have some scoring. So in R, they, they don't call them a dictionary, they call it a, uh, a lexicon. So a lexicon is a list of words that have some kind of scoring. This scoring, I don't know what this scoring is. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Let's see the last words that we see. Oh, sorry. So when when you're calling data sets and maybe you are not sure, you can start by calling a package and then you follow with two semicolons, and then it highlights all the functions under that package, yeah, and the data sets um, in that package. So you can see the different like, parts of speech, the functions like get sentiments, get stop words, and you can see our data set here, stop words. So these are the last six observations uh, of that data set and these are, score, these are scoring they are calling onyx. Uh, again, I'm not sure what that is, but now we have these top words. Now, because our data is already in a, in a tidy text format, we can make use of uh, some of the deploy of verbs or some of the tidy verse verbs, like the join function that was, um, I think Christine talked about it last time. And the join, the join functions are used for merging data sets. Yeah, and we have various joint functions. We have 
anti join, inner join, left join, total join, and so on. So in this case, we will use the anti join function. So the, what the anti join function does is it looks up the words in our data set now, data five, in the data set uh, of stop words here. And if it finds some, the words there, then it removes them from our data set. Okay, so it's like it's deleting these stop words that are in our data set. So again, I repeat, so anti-join function, it will, it will look up the words that are in our data set in the uh, list of stop words. And then it finds um, uh, the words that are in, uh, in the, the stop words data set in our data set, then it's going to delete them from our data set. And that's how we remove our, our stop words. So let's do that. So I'm assigning, I'm assigning an object to data six. I take my data five uh, that has already, we've already unnested tokens and sorted the words. Then I use the anti-join function um, to remove the stop words. So let's run that. Okay, so if we, if we call data six, you can see, uh, because this is ordered, you can see now the words are gone. So initially we had, um, we had this, these were the most common words there and of have our, that to, uh, you know, now we have um, these words. We have barring, country, disease, travel, 16, 2020, yeah. So yeah, so then now we have more meaningful words. So another way of implementing this is, uh, if you're not using pipes, so pipes, this, the pipe operator just says, take data, do this, and also do this. So you can take, um, you can just call, we call it data seven just the anti-join function. And then the data from uh, our data set, that's data five. And then the data set from which, the data set we want to match, that's stop words. And we should, uh, it's anti, anti underscore join. Then we should perform this function. Again, if you want to call an, an object in R, uh, you have very many options. You can uh, you can click here and you should see it displayed on your on your end here, over here. You can also um, call it like we've been calling here, um, data seven on a separate line, or you can add a semicolon. To your, to your line of code and just call it. And there you should call the data. Yeah. So now <clears throat> we have a data set that does not have stop words. But when we look at these words, we see some numbers that are, might not be very important. So, so let me just check what we have in the last uh, rows. So we will need to remove these numbers and some of these words that are not very, uh, very, very, very informative. So I see we have uh, some meaningful words uh, in the last rows. So we need to remove some of these numbers because as is expected with text data, you expect numbers within the text. And sometimes numbers can be informative. Sometimes they may not be informative. And in that case, we need to remove these numbers and symbols. So there are various functions in R for, for removing numbers and funny symbols. And these functions are, uh, are in this R. So you don't know, need to load any package. So we have um, the G sub function. Uh, it's, it, it's a pattern matching and replacement function. Uh, we also have um, functions like grep, grepol, uh, sub, uh, subset R, string R, string R functions from the string R package. 
We also have regexpr. So let's start with GSAB. So what GSAB does is it, it, you, it identifies a pattern and then it replaces that pattern. So let's uh, try, like I've already assigned an object X to this string. 2020 has been a 2020 had the, this sentence that no, does not make sense just for practice. So we have a gsub and a sub function. So gsub, what gsub does is it identifies the pattern and it replaces all the matches. So if you want to look for um, all patterns that have all words that have 2020, it will identify all of them and replace with whatever you asked it to replace with. Now the sub function just looks for the first one the first pattern and it places that and leaves out the rest. So let's try with this one. So we run this code. So we have our object. So I have an object numbers uh, and I'm using the, the function sub. So I want it to identify the pattern 2020 and replace it with a space from this, um, from this object X. So when we run that, you see that it has only replaced the first uh, the first pattern, the first 2020, and it has left the other one. Yeah. So if you were to do the if you were to perform the same uh, to to use the G sub function, then you will notice that it removes all the 2020s in my object. So that's how the G sub function works. Okay. Um, we also have the grapple and grep function, uh, which is what we'll be using today. So there are also pattern checking and stream, string replacement functions. So um, grapple, uh, what grapple does is returns uh, true or false uh, when a pattern, it returns true when a pattern is found in the corresponding character string. We we'll see that in a few. Grep, it, instead of returning a, a true or false, it returns a vector of indices, as in positions where that pattern is found. Yeah, so we will use the the grep function because remember our goal is not to um, replace this the, this uh, numbers. Uh, our goal is to remove them from the data set. Yeah, so. Uh, I have an object here that I'm calling names. So I have two names, Faith and my name. So when I run that, I have that object. So I'll use the grep function to identify a pattern FA and from this object, and let's see what it returns. So the grep function returns the, the position, the indices, the index, the index, sorry, the index. So it shows us that the the name that has that um, position is that has that pattern is in position one. That's fake. Um, let's try mi. Uh, mi. Okay. I don't know why it's returning one, position one. Should give it two. Okay, let's first look at grapple. I will come back there. So grapple, uh, grapple would return um, the, it would return a true or false. When we run this, it shows, yes, it's true. It's found the first name, for the first name it's true. If it's not present for other names, it does not return anything. So that's how the grapple function works. So in our case, we will use grep to, to, to remove these numbers. Yeah. So um, I'll run this command here. So we we had uh, the data six. So we call data six. Uh -huh. Because it's a day frame, we have to 
use this closed bracket. Um, then we use the grep function and we want it to, uh, uh, to get this pattern, um, identify that pattern, and then ident get, identify that pattern from um, this data frame. And we want it to identify it from the column word. So when we run that, oops, it's missing. There's a comma there. Yeah. So has what it has done is it has selected the column with uh, the words the the rows with the the word 2020 here. And so if you wanted to remove it, then we would have to use a minus sign, meaning remove, select all that do not have this pattern. So we run that again. And call that object. You notice that now we don't have 2020. So initially, we take you back. We had 2020 on position seven. Now we don't have 2020 on that on that position. So that's how you remove numbers. So if you wanted to remove 16, um, you do the same. On that object. Okay, now you see it's, it's gone, but now we have 2020. So, what happens if you want to remove all the numbers? Yeah, so what you do is you specify a pattern. So, grep has um, allows us to specify different patterns. So, it has some functions, it has some arguments for patterns that you can explore. I won't look at them here, but this when explore. So if you wanted to remove all the numbers, we would specify a, a pattern that says look for all numbers between 0 and 9 uh, and remove them. So the pattern should be and let's see if we still have those numbers. Uh, okay. uh, Tibol zero two. Okay. So this is a way you specify your patterns. This is a way that um, that um, this function grep. Uh, there, there are patterns that it accepts, and there are those that it doesn't. So you need to just familiarize yourself with what patterns it accepts. So let me just check something. Uh, I think I'm missing something. Oh, yeah. So it's the brackets. I'm missing the brackets. Yeah. So you need to familiarize with your, yourself with the, the patterns uh, that, that you need to input. For it to, to understand what what you want it to do. So this means that remove all numbers uh, between zero and nine in the data set. So when we run that, um, you see that now we don't have those numbers. We don't have 2020, 20, we don't have 16. And now we have uh, a clean data set with meaningful words. Okay. So I'm going to read in. So remember, we were just using the, the data set I copied from the website. Now we are going to read in our, our multiple data sets, uh, tokenize, remove stock words, um, remove numbers, and uh, uh, construct a frequency table and see uh, which are the most common words. So I had already read the data. Uh, it's in this object, it's pictures here. Um, yeah, so you see all the data sets are here. Then 
uh, we, we, we change it, we, we have to convert it to a T-ball so that it's easy to work, uh, for us to work with other data manipulation verbs. And then we will unnest tokens and remove stop words. Then we will, we will also group, group by the documents and do accounts. So I'll do it step by step. So start there. So now we have people. Yeah, see a table. Uh, it has two two columns, one with the document ID, the other one with the text. And from there we will we learn nest tokens, remove stop words. Turn up to that point. Okay. Uh -huh. So you see it has unnested tokens. Uh, it has also maintained the, the the document column showing what document it's from. And it has removed stop words. So we don't expect to see stop words. So when we count, when we count, so count, that means count the words in this document. Uh, oh yeah, so we need to group them first. Um, So you can even look from here. So count document ID word. Okay. Missing something. So count word. Okay. Uh, then argument should not be that. Yes. So it has counted. So when we call that, we can see it has counted all the words, like 19 appears seven times, 2020 20 appears one time. So we can also sort this and say just uh, sort and sorts for us. Yeah, so now we, we see um, the words and the most common words. So Kenyans is the most common word in this document, April. Program is the most common word in May. So these are the same data sets. I just I have different types. Just wanted to show you how to read different types. In June, the most common word was 2020. Um, uh, the second common word was zero, shillings, health, Okay, so we need to remove these numbers so that we are left with meaningful words. Okay, so so when you group um, when you group, uh, let me just go back to the original word. So it does the same thing. I was just trying to split so that we see what's happening step by step. So when you run this, you get the same thing. So whenever you group your your variables, you need to ungroup because Later, you might need to use data, this data set. And because it's grouped, you get error. So it's good program practice to ungroup your data whenever you group it. So that's what we did. So now let's remove the, the numbers using the grep function. So we remove all numbers between 0 and 9. We're going to use this. Um, yeah. So let's, let's call this object. Yeah, and you see now the numbers are gone. We're only left with the words. Um, there are also words that, that might be here that we don't like, or we don't feel like they are, they are important. Words like shillings, well, I don't think it's very informative. So we can remove that using the same function. So we just need to say the, the pattern is shillings, and then we remove it from that from that document. 
So when you call that object, um, and see now we don't have shillings anymore. Yeah, and you can do the same for all the words you feel like they're not important. Okay. So at this point, let's let's filter by each document to see what are the most common words per document. Here we are seeing all the documents, but some we would want to see um, which document, which words are common for April uh, one dot txt. So we'll make use of the filter function. So filter selects columns. Yeah, select if you are to use the select function, you'll be selecting no filter select rows. Sorry, and if you are to use the select function, you'll be selecting the columns. So we use the filter function, it's uh, within the deployer package, and then we we tell the we tell R what rows we want to select. So note that we use two equal signs here, meaning is equal to if you used one equal sign. Uh, in R, when you use one equal sign, it's like you're assigning the this string here to the object document ID. And in fact, if you try running that, you get an error. So it has to be two equal signs, meaning it's equal to. So you take um, this data, speech underscore ID2, then you filter where the document is April 1.txt. So when you run that, you can see now uh, we only have words from this document, april onetxt and their frequencies. Yeah, and we see Kenyans is the most common, fellow, medical, pandemic, people, efforts, health. So you can already, you already have an idea of what the president was talking about in this speech. He was talking about Kenyans, addressing fellow Kenyans, talking about COVID, measures, health, pandemic, efforts. Yes, yeah, so we already have a picture of what he was talking about. So let's try another speech, that's June. Um, so in June, he was talking about health, um, protocols, disease, pandemic, Kenyans, ministry, what, what, okay. Let's see in July. Um, what the president was talking about. Yeah, so here again, um, was talking about protocols, responsibility, crisis. So you, you can see new words um, in each speech, and now you have an idea of what's happening. Again, you see there's, a, there's another word here, another word here, A, the caps, that I don't think is important. So you can filter, and you can filter from here, actually. So the filter function allows you to um, specify many arguments. So like we can say, um, we want to filter, let's say we want to filter July and August uh, data. So what we we'll do is, we we'll begin by um, assigning an object, uh, let's say month, dot strings. These strings to this object, these strings that um, July 1, and uh, one okay. and we will use the filter function. But now we'll say um, filter where document ID is in this, this object, month. Okay. So we can call it two months. And then we say take this data set. So we we'll just change this. So instead of is equal to, we will ask R to look for. Uh, uh, sorry, in, in this object mark. So we run that. It, we obtain data for two months. 
you can see we have July and April. So that's how you select um, data for, for the two months. So what if you wanted to remove this one, this, this A here? We, we can also do that within the, the, the filter function. So we'll have a comma and then we say, oh, not a, use an, an, the add function, this symbol here. And then we say word is equal to this one. So, so it has selected these words, but we don't want to select, we want to remove them. So we say it's not equal to. So it's not equal to is denoted by an exclamation mark and an equal sign. So when we run that, we see it has selected all other words that do not are not this, this one. Okay. Yeah, so that's how you filter, that's how you um, and nest tokens, remove to stop words. That's how you you uh, tables to see what are the most common words. Yeah, I don't know if you have any questions until this point. Thank you, uh, Shell. So we just had a question from Michael, which I think was answered mm -hmm. uh, during your presentation. And then, yeah, don't say that one is just too short true i think uh in your earlier era and then peter who left said that is this the case in small data set uh in case of a large data set is it easy to find the positions i think that's uh where you are previously but i, I think uh, the questions were actually addressed in the course of your presentation kindly go on okay Thank oh you. uh sorry we have a question from shadra kibet how do you deal with typos in your text file or type poles. By type poles, oh, okay, okay. So type poles, uh, for instance, uh, let's say a word like Kenyans was written as Kenyans. So in that case, you would use the G sub function that I introduced earlier. Um, yeah. So you'd use the G sub function and specify that. Um, let me just do it here. So let's say your object is, let's call, let me call my object K and, um, and allocate this string to this object K. So if I run that, uh, sorry, I, I meant to say K ans, not K ans. Yeah. So assuming you have such, have such an object, so you know it should be Kenyan. So how do you uh, deal with this typo? So you can use the G sub function. I, remember I said the G sub function, you identify a pattern, and then you, 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 you give a replacement for that pattern. So I'd use the G sub function, I'd say G sub. So the pattern I'm looking for, the word in this case, Kenyan. So I want to replace it with Kenyans, and you are replacing it in this object. Okay. When I run that, uh, half Kenyans. So if I call K, Uh, okay, so first, um, I'd have to, to assign an object to this, to this function so that I know what I'm referring to. Because with R, it calls, um, if I assign an object K, it will call the last object assigned. So K was Kans, so that's why I'm getting Kans. But in case, if I wanted to call Kenyans, uh, let me just call it W. Sorry about my naming, <laughs> not very creative. Um, just redo it. Um, so if I call that object, I can see now it's not Kans, it's Kenyans. 
So that's how you do it. And you would use a similar, a similar approach for data frames. Uh, I don't know if I've answered your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Shomi. I think uh, that has answered it. Can you continue? Okay. And just to mention, there are so many ways of doing this replacement. I'm just giving an example of GSAB. Um, you can also use um, what uh, uh, Christine was using last time, the string R functions. You can explore those. Um, yeah. So now we have our data is in a format that is easy to work with, with ggplot2 and, uh, and ggplot2 and those verbs. So we will do some visualizations. Um, so we'll use a word cloud. So a word cloud is a cloud of words. <laughs> yeah, so it shows you the, the most common words. And then the size of the words matter based on how frequent the words are in the data set. So this is the function for word cloud. So I'm using this data set, speech underscore tidy, that we just cleaned over there. And then the function is with word cloud. So I'm using unique word because I'll show you once I run, I'll come back to that. So the function is word cloud of what? So the column is word um, by what? By n, which is the frequency. And because you can't have all words in a word cloud, it will look so cluttered. Uh, it has a function to, to specifying the maximum number of words. And you can also even uh, change the colors you know, play around with the colors. You're allowed to specify more than one color. And you're also allowed to, um, uh, you know, uh, scale the size so that it fits on your graph. So I'm going to run this and see what we have. So I've got an error. So this error is very common. Uh, where you're told error in plot dot new figures margin is too large. It occurs when the plot window is too small. So you see my plot window is quite small, so it can't plot. So how you resolve this is you enlarge your plot window and you try running the code again. And you can see it has plotted. Yeah, so this is a word cloud. So it shows us the, the most common words. So the, 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 the most frequent word is Kenyan, and see it's very big, uh, 2020, program. So this is a quick way of visualizing which are the most common words, okay? So you can, so I'm using unique words. Let me work with words and see what we get. Then I'll tell you why I'm using that function. So, yeah, we are. So you notice that there are some words that are repeated, like health, health, health. I think I see it more than four times. Kenyans, I see it more than four times. So this is happening because remember, this this um, this function has a lot of um, uh, this. I mean, this uh, this uh, this doc this data set has a lot has so many uh, data sets in it. So if you think about a data set, a speech that was given in April, it had Ken these words, this Kenyan, Kenyans, help, uh, the same words would be found in other, other documents. So that's why you see um, they are repeating. So to avoid this, you just say pick unique words. So the function is unique word, and you should pick the unique words. So now you can, it gives you a better picture of the most common words. So you can also filter, um, filter by, let's say, the, the document like April and try and see um, what are the, the most common words in this word cloud. You can also vary the, uh, the, the maximum words, could be 10, could be 100, depending on what you want, okay? The other visualization tool you can use is a bar chart. Um, you can make use of the ggplot2 functions. Uh, ggplot package has very nice functions for visualization. And I, I, I won't go into detail. I hope we'll have a session on ggplot2 sometime. So 
uh, what we will do in this case, we just plot bar charts showing the most uh, uh, common words for for each um, speech and maybe for all. Yeah, so this is the function. So I start by uh, getting the data again. Uh, so this is, we had already done this before. Then now I can plot the, the ggplot chart. So the, okay, so I take the data, I filter, I want to see the, the common words for me. Then this is for, uh, this function here is for reordering these words. So you want it to sort by uh, the, the end so that when you plot, it's, it's arranged based on the, the one with the highest frequency to the one with the lowest frequency. So these are the ggplot functions. So ggplot, um, two func ggplot two functions. So we have ggplot where you specify the mapping. So the mapping is here is what is going to go to your x-axis and what is going to go to your n, uh, to your y-axis. So I want word to be on my x-axis and an n to be on my y-axis. Then the geom functions, it can be geom column, geom bar, geom point. It specifies what kind of a chart you want. So in my case, I want a column chart, yeah. Then uh, I label the chart using this function. And I also label uh, the title using this function. So we also have the beam function in ggplot2 that help us um, manipulate the text uh, in the plot to, to suit what we want. So like sometimes you don't want the title to be too big. So this is the function you use. Um, we also have the code flip function. So what it does is, so we've had plotted my chart such that um, word is on the x axis and the n is on the y axis. I can switch so that now word is on the y axis and n is on the um, x axis. So that's what this function does. But we're just going to run this. As I said, I won't go into much detail. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a session. The, the ggplot2 is wide. Um, yeah, so we can't explore everything today. Uh, because we also don't want to look at other things. So now you see a chart has been generated uh, with the most um, common words. So in this here, I had specified that I wanted to filter with eight common words, the most uh, eight common words. And you see it has, um, it has highlighted eight common words. And the most frequent in Neo's program, um, shillings, billion. Yeah, so it's like they were talking about money. Uh, finance. So I've also done the same thing for April, just filtering and see what April was about. So I'll run all of them and then I'll show you all of them at once. Okay. So in R, so we, we notice we've plotted four plots, four charts. Um, so we can't show all of them. So if we wanted to show all of them on this window, we can make use of um, uh, the G G grid extra package. So grid extra helps you organize your charts on this uh, on this pin. So what you do, it has a function called grid grid arrange dot arrange. So you specify what charts and the number of columns. So in my case, I've put all the charts I want to see and want to see two columns. So it will I'll have two columns, and because there are four, I'll have two rows and two columns. So when I run that. Yeah, now you can see that my, my charts have been populated here. So you can see for April, for May, for June, and for July. So it becomes very easy to compare. We have numbers, forgot to remove them. Uh, yeah, so now you can compare and see what were the most common words by month, yeah? Kenyans, program, what, what, yeah. So that's um, uh, a bit of how you can visualize this data. There are so many ways of visualizing. Please, when you have time, go and look at the ggplot2 verbs and the kind of charts you can generate. Now, uh, so, uh, we have a small question. So okay. before we go to the next subtopic, uh, Michael Ranga is uh, saying, please clarify the ungroup function. I see that we grouped, and then after some time, we ungrouped in the same uh, pipeline of data. I think that was previously, yeah. 
Okay, thank you so much, Michael. So I say I mentioned um, that whenever you group your data, it's good programming practice to ungroup the data because uh, like this data set over here. Um, okay, so if we grouped this data set uh, here, so sometimes you want to use the same data set because it's grouped, you are get, you'll get errors later. So what you do, every time you group your data set, you ungroup it. Yeah, I don't know if that answers your questions, Michael. Uh, I think it does, yeah. So sometimes, Michael, when you, you're trying to work or analyze or continue plotting uh, group data, it gives you errors. So some of those errors are actually um, uh, can be worked on uh, just, just by ungrouping the data. Okay, continue, shall we? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Faith. So now, uh, I see we don't have much time, but we don't have so many, we only have two sections and they are, uh, they are quick sessions. So uh, we will, as I mentioned, we learn about a statistic that is used in text mining. It's called term frequency inverse document frequency. So what it does, it's, it checks how important a word is to a document in a collection of documents. So remember, we have like 11 documents here. We have March, April, all the way to June. So we want to see which are the important words for each of these documents. So it's a weighting factor. And how it checks the most important words, or rather the most unique words that distinguishes a document from the others. It, it, it uses a, it's a weighting factor, I said, and then it's a statistic. So it's based on, uh, so TF, TF means term frequency. So term frequency is the number of times a word appears in a document, let's brief. So the number of times Kenyans appear in this document divided by the total number of words in this document. So Kenyans appears two times, the total number of words in this document is 40. So it's two divided by 40. So the inverse document frequency looks at how many, um, it's, it's a statistic based on the natural log. Uh, let me just open my, oops, that? Let me it again, okay. Okay, I'll explain later. Um, there are some errors that are preventing it from the running, maybe because of the changes I've made to this document. So, um, so it takes the natural, yeah, just popped out, yeah, popped up. So it takes the natural log of the number of documents. So we have 11 documents and the number of documents that contain a word, okay? So we have 11 documents. And let's say we have a word like because, and it appears in all these documents. So you'd have, 11 divided by 11, which is one. And the natural log of one is zero. Okay. So uh, the term frequency, inverse doc, uh, document frequency is a product of the term frequency and the inverse document frequency. So if this is zero, then everything becomes zero. And when the TFIDF is zero, then it means that word is not very important for that document because it's appearing in other documents. So now what the TFIDF um, uh, statistic does is it helps us uh, remove the, the stop words we were talking about, yeah? So when you remove stop words like we did before, sometimes it's not, it's, okay, you can remove stop words, but sometimes you might have words that, yes, they are not stop words, but again, they are not very informative. So, um, when you use the TFIDF statistic, it helps you identify um, what words are important. Okay, uh, I hope that's clear. Um, if you have questions, please please feel free to ask. Um, yeah. So um, now we are going to implement that. So some of these steps are the steps we've already implemented before. So they just run them. I'll just run this code because we've already looked at it before. And I'll go straight to the TFIDF. So um, here you see my document. So in this case, I've not removed stop words because I want to, to show you, uh, us to see how uh, the TFIDF works. 
So we have the words, we have the, um, the number of times it appears. So we are going to, so first for us to get the term frequency, as I said, it's you take the number of words divided by the total number of words. In this case, you take the word, the number of times the word there appears, 184 times, divided by the total number of words, of uh, words in this document, let's say 2000. So for us to obtain the TFIDF, we need to have a column of the total number of words. So, yeah, so that's what you're going to do. So we'll obtain the total number of words by, uh, we take the data, we sorry, we group by the document and then we summarize, uh, we get the total, we summarize, we get the total for the total number of words for um, each document using this function, sum of n, okay? So if we run that, um, you can see it has given us the total number of words for each document. Okay, um, so June has like the highest number of words. So then, because it's a it's a table, and remember our data, our tidy our tidy data is in a table. So we can use the join functions again to to join the two data sets. So that now we have a column with total number of words. So the left join function now, it will look up the words in our data set in the list in this the data set of total words and it will only um it will it will keep rows that are found in those data sets even if they are not so it will keep rows that are found in this speech underscore word data set um and also in total underscore words data set okay um and and it will uh, okay sorry I'm confusing you. So what it does is it will look up um, the words that are found in uh, this data set, in this data set. Then it will keep all the rows that are in this data set, in the speech underscore words data set, even if they are not in this other data set. Okay, so I'm going to run that so that we see. So you see, so it has now introduced the new column with the total number of words. Uh, per document, and now it makes us easy for us to get the TFIDF statistic. So we can obtain the first term frequency using the mutate function. So mutate, we are introducing a new column, and then we are saying uh, we'll have a new col one column for rank that is based on the the row number because the data is already ordered. So uh, when we take the row number, it should give us the correct ranks and then we're going to get the term frequency uh, which is you take column n divide by the total so let's run that and see yeah so you see we have the term frequency here and it's a fraction okay so in r if we wanted to get the tfidf uh we don't have to go we don't have to uh, calculate the tf then get the IDF, we don't have to do that. So there's a function uh, within the tidy text package that allows us to um, bind the two. So it calculates the uh, term frequency for you, the inverse uh, document frequency for you, and it binds the two. So you get um, a data set that has TF, IDF, and TF, IDF. But for you to get um, uh, those statistics, you need to have a column of the total number of words because it will use that to calculate the term frequency and the inverse document frequency. So the function is bind underscore IDF. Okay, so you're binding um, the word. So you're looking at the word. Then you specify the document so that when it returns, you can see uh, the, the document, I mean, from what document the, the TFIDF is from, and N, then you can also arrange uh, in descending or, order using the arrange function. So desk means descending. If you don't want it to be descending, you just do it as this. Yeah, so let's run this. Let me see. Okay, let's see what we have. So you see now we have the 
TFIDF. Yeah. We have retained the document, we have the word. Yeah. So let's see. Um, if you wanted, you did not want it to order by uh, in, in wanted it to arrange in ascend, ascending order, then would not uh, specify that it's descending, just leave it as this. And when we run in, um, yeah, it's not in it's actually it's in a setting on order so starting with the words that have uh, a tfidf of zero the most common words we are talking about the stop word yeah so these are not important words we have a tfidf of zero so if we look at the the, call, the last columns in the tail function uh, you can see the most important words are coming last okay Okay, so yeah, so that's how you, you obtain the TFIDF scores. Um, you can you can use let me just go back to uh, this. Yeah, so from this TFIDF statistic, you can identify the words that were very important for each document. Like for me, the word he was very important. <laughs> you can remove this, sometimes it's not informative. It's, I'm laughing because <laughs> it could mean that he, he, you know, if he kept saying he, he, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, in a COVID speech, yeah. So you can also filter uh, so that you have a better picture of the words that were very important, like in July, um, first, first was very important exercise, conformity path, remember. So first opening, I guess. You can do the same for all other data sets. Yeah. So you can also visualize um, this to get a clear picture using the tools I just showed you, the ggplot two tools. Yeah. I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, thank you, Shalmik. We have one from Noel. Uh, how would you handle synonyms when generating the weighing statistic across documents? You say you want disease, infection, illness to be treated with similar importance. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Noel. Yeah, so um, that's another section of text mining we call uh, topic modeling. Yeah, now you will group those words that you want to be treated the same way together. So in this case, we are just doing, a, like we're just introducing concepts. Um, so I'll not talk about topic models today, but we can do that um, sometime, uh, but you can go and explore. So once you have, actually once when, when you have this statistic, it becomes very easy for you to do the, the topic modeling, grouping those words, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So no, actually topic model needs to be part of this session. The session was actually quite wide. So we decided to have topic modeling on its own as a meetup uh, next year. So look out for that. Thank you. Uh, shall we kindly let's finish on this so that we can go into groups and process. Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm actually uh, going to the last section, should not take long. So now the last section for today's training in sentiment analysis or what we call opinion mining. So it's basically uh, trying to understand what is the emotion behind the text, yeah? And as I said, well, because we have a tidy data structure, it becomes very, very easy for us to implement sentiment analysis using the joint functions. Now, uh, tidy text has a dictionary of words a dictionary of sentiments, yeah? So we have, it provides access to three lexicons. I said lexicons are words that have some kind of scoring. So it has three, so we have affine, we have Bing, and we have NRC. And each of these um, dictionaries uses a, a unique classifier. Like Bing classifies sentiments, now the words into positive and negative. For instance, if you had words like happy, sad, tired so it would classify happy as positive sad as negative tired as negative okay then we have a fin that uses a numeric uh, 
a numeric uh, scale. Uh, so it, it has a scale of between negative five and five, where negative five means positive, negatives mean positive, um, and positive means, positive scores mean positive sentiments. Then we have the last uh, lexicon provided by its, uh, sentiment analysis that also groups into a binary fashion, but now it's a bit ex explicit. So it groups us into positive and negative, but now under positive, it has um, uh, more classifications. Like we have joy, uh, anticipation, negative, we have fear, anger, and so on. So today I'll introduce you to one, how you get those dictionaries and how you, you join the, the, words, uh, you, you, the words in your document with those sentiments so that you understand the, what, is the, what is the emotional um, context of that text. Okay, so uh, tidy text has this function, get underscore sentiments that enables you to pull um, your data. So if I, I just call the of oh, the text. If I just that function. So it, it lists uh, of oh, text. It lists the functions, the data set. So you can see get stop words, get sentiments is is one of the functions in that package so you load this dictionary uh, using this function so note uh, when you're loading there's some licensing so be required to to work, agree to some licenses um so you just it will ask you to select yes or no so you say yes and continue and it downloads so you can see a fin has a negative uh, and of uh, um uh, numeric scaling where you have negative and positive values. Uh, you see it with Bing, it has a binary classifier, so either negative or positive. And with NRC, you have um, the sentiments, and now they, they, are, they, are, they, they classify uh, um, the words uh, in, I think, about seven categories. Is it about trust, fear? Uh, Inga, whatever. And then you notice these are repetition of words. Now, um, these, these dictionaries were trained using um, word cloud, with using uh, words from the internet. Some were trained using uh, some data, I don't remember. So what happens is these sentiments might not work well with your data, but they have already been tested to work well with Twitter data and uh, other data sets but they might not work very well with your data. So what you can do is you can come up with your own dictionary of sentiments based on your understanding of the data you have. And then you will, um, you will uh, use the inner join now to, to join um, your, your, your data with the sentiments to see what, is this, what are the sentiments associated with the data you have. So I'm just going to um, run the command. So we are using the inner join function. So the inner join function, we look up words in your data set in this dictionary. And if it finds them in the other dictionary, it keeps words that are in both data set. Okay, so that's what this is doing. So I'm using uh, Bing sentiments. Okay, so if I call that data, now you can see a new column has been added showing the sentiment associated with each word. Like comprehensive is positive, virus is negative, prompt is positive, infections is negative. So it makes sense. Uh, most of these words are positive, yeah? Yeah, then from here you can do some visualizations to see what words, um, what words are associated with the positive sentiment. You can do some filters. I'll try some here. Um, group uh, filter. We want to filter uh, rows where the sentiment is positive. Okay. 
Yeah, and you can see it has filtered. So you can also visualize this using, you can count these words. You can use uh, visualization tools and see what uh, sentiments are positive. So you can use uh, the other library, the other dictionary that can have seen and see and play around with it to see what sentiments you get. And yeah, so you can also filter by the document and sort and see what sentiments you get. So let me run this. So this has already, uh, this code is you group by sentiment and then you, you count. So it shows you how many are negative, how many are positive. Yeah, so it gives you an idea of what is the emotion associated with this text. Yeah, so that's it from, for me from today, uh, for today. I don't know if there are questions, please. Thank you so much, Xiaomi, for that. Uh, so I don't know if there's a question or a comment, but Moses said the analysis sounds quite uh, qualitative. What's the difference? Thematic analysis. So uh, maybe just comment. I feel like it's, it's just a comment. Okay, come again, you said the, the analysis? The analysis sounds uh, like qualitative. What is the difference? Thematic analysis. So I don't know okay. what actually that means, but just comment. Okay. Here. Yeah, yeah, I think I understand what he means. So um, remember when I was starting this session, I said there's very many approaches to text mining. And we have packages like Wontida, text mining, and we have the tidy data uh, approach where you use the tidy text package. So what the tidy text package does is it helps you clean your data and uh, put it in a tidy text format that is easier for you to use other data manipulation verbs. And that's now where the, the quantitative aspect comes in. So the main advantage of using tidy text is to help you convert your data in, into a form that you are familiar with. Yeah. But you can use other approaches to um, Quantida, uh, those from Quantida package and text mining that uh, in my view are uh, very a bit qualitative, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Xiaomi. Um, kindly just comment on the group exercises. Uh, so after Xiaomi uh, gives a comment on the group exercises, this, this part is just about uh, you discussing with other people in a small group of around five people, uh, going through uh, the exercises that she has, she has given you. We have the solutions down there. So in case you're stuck, you, you should have something to confirm with or double check with. Um, and also kindly, when we do the group poll sessions, uh, just uh, volunteer someone, volunteer or choose someone uh, to share their screen or to guide the discussion in that group. It can be anyone. And also just uh, do that in the shortest time possible so that you don't waste a lot of time uh, deciding on someone because uh, you have like uh, 15 minutes to just go through this and conclude the session. So thank you, Xiaomi. Uh, just kindly uh, just tell us what you're going to do in our groups. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Faith. Um, so this is just a simple exercise. Um, so what you are doing is just practicing what you've learned today. So it should take should not take a lot of time. Um, so we will we will load a, a data set. So in the folder that is on GitHub, these are the data is in the exercises folder. Let me show you. Uh, so, when you go to text, is this folder we are calling exercises over here? So it has three data sets. It has August, November, and September, and they are different formats. So you have Word document, PDF, and text. So that's the, the data you'll be reading. Then you convert it into a, a tidy text uh, format, and then you remove stop word numbers. And then you identify the most um, 10 most common words from each speech. Um, you also identify the 10 most important words using TFIDF. And then you will do a quick sentiment analysis using the, the Bing lexicon, yeah? the one that has the binary sc uh, scoring, and identify just how many words were positive and how many were negative. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you, Shalmit. So uh, I have uh, added the link to the GitHub in case you don't have these uh, entire scripts and the data that she's using. Uh, just kindly click on that and you can be able to go through the group exercises. Uh, please uh, make sure that uh, you understand, uh, share que uh, questions and also yeah, network and know each other uh, in your groups, but also do that in 15 minutes. Because uh, by 1.10, I'll have to bring you back to the main session because we'll have to conclude. So I'm just going to uh, break you out into groups and uh, I hope that um, uh, yeah, you, you have a nice time interacting with this data. Hi everyone, I see we have five of us. Um, who, who feels comfortable to share our screen? Today is Hi, uh, so we have Susan, Ezra and Mukundi, who feels, well, now we have Susan, Ezra, and Mukundi. <laughs> hey, uh, who feels like sharing the screen so that we, we do this tutorial? I, uh, this is Susan speaking. I, I joined a bit late, so I, I, I don't think I can lead the, the, you know, the exercise, but hopefully, hopefully someone else can volunteer. How about Ezra and Mukundi? Okay, uh, I think I'll, I'll end up sharing so that we don't waste so much time and do something. Okay, okay, cool. Let me share. Hey Lucy. Oh, okay, it's uh, it's loading.
Hey, I'm sorry, my screen did freeze for some minutes. <laughs> let me let me try resharing again. Okay. Yeah. You can see my screen, right? Yes, now. Yeah. yeah, I knew, yeah, before I was wondering what was going on because I thought something was wrong with my computer. No, 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 it was on my end. <laughs> Everything just froze for a minute. So we can start. We have, uh, um, so we can, we can, the, so the first the first question is we load we load sorry we load the data into R Studio, and then we convert. So as we've been taught, so the first step here is loading the data. Well, uh, so we load the data. So our our environment the environment is empty. So I do not have to use that uh, the, the 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 syntax for clearing it clearing my environment. But you know that it's good programming to actually clear it. So what we do is we can oh, and then um, bear with me. My internet is also unstable. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I need to load the package. So uh, sorry about the background noise. Kindly bear with me. So uh, to avoid to avoid all this, let me use let's use the function suppress. Yes, suppress startup packages, and then we can. Uh, it's it minimizes. Yeah, awesome. So we can actually run the data. It should take a minute, so we have it there. So we the next question was to convert the data into a tidy text format and remove stop words. So we have seen that we use the annex the annex tokens and as well as uh, the anti join. So once we run a pipe, sorry. Okay. Faith, my apologies. My internet did freeze for some minutes. That's why we are here. Yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. I think you're actually doing better than some of the others that you're working on this. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have like, um, I'm sorry, but we have like eight minutes. Uh, and then you have to go back to the session. So, yeah. Right. Mm. Allow me to was oh I haven't loaded the tidy text package. Yeah. So we have 
obtain the text. Awesome. So I'm thinking right now it will be easier for us to run this. So we have removed we have removed the stop words. Then the next question is to identify the ten most common words. So we have identified. So we can check that by running again the practice August. So we are using the, the August document, the August file. So using the September file, the September speech. And then we can look at the November. So using the this the the tidy this function to identify the 10 most, the term frequency, we identify the 10 most important words for the speech, for each speech. Yeah. Okay. So we have also looked at the total, the total number of words. How, yes, we can see that. Yeah, we can, we've looked at the total number of words in this, um, in the object or practice ID one. Yeah, and then uh, so what we do is now we join the two. We join the total words and one that has the most frequent, the ten most frequency words. Um, so using the left join, and then finally instead of doing this from step from line fifty one to line fifty eight, we can easily do this with this simple line, as we have learned today. Okay, so from this package with, uh, from, sorry, from this object with the most frequent, most frequent words spoken, we can, uh, um, we can identify all the 10. Awesome, so we can actually see this by seeing, for example, Head, we can look at just the previous one, which is the practice December, the practice December November. So we can have a look at that. So we have seen, so we have just a minute. Yeah, so this is just the practice November. We haven't we haven't weighted it using the term, the this the line sixty two. So we can look at that, which is now this specific object. So we head. For example, when we look at the November one, we can see we have seen what we have calculated from line from line fifty-eight to six is yes, from line sorry fifty-three to six to fifty-eight. We have seen this. It's calculated. Um, sorry, the R has done it in one in one uh, one line, just the one syntax. So we have this. Sorry, the one function. So we have this is the weights. As we've seen, we have seen this is the enf enforcement is one that is um, it's an important word, and it is of it is highly weighted. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then. Uh, um, so the, I, I believe the last question was on sentiment analysis, and we've been specifically told to use the Bing. Yeah, and the Bing, we've seen the Bing changes, converts it, gives the sentiment positive, positive or negative. Sorry, my, my, my apologies. So yes, so we can look at it. Let's look at the head. Practice sentiments. So we, we see that in the in the in this in this in this in these speeches of so we haven't we haven't we haven't specified so in the speeches in November, September, and August for positive words were 68 and then negative were 34. Okay, I believe we we have answered all the questions because we've also performed. Yeah. Is that clear? Please let's look, let's watch the, the tutorial, the recording again to understand better. Uh, when will the recording be available online? Um, it should be available in the course of the day. I'll, I'll share it, I'll share it with, 
uh, I'll share it with you, everyone, in the course of the day. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we can leave. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Awesome. We can leave this group session so that we join the main one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think one, one of the things we forgot to is to introduce ourselves. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, the rest of the team is joining. Awesome. I think that was one of the tasks we had been told in, our, in our, the breakout sessions. I, I guess you can start. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm Lucy. I'm Lucy Njoki. I'm the organizer of Our Ladies Nairobi and leave alone that I'm also a student of Hasselt University. Yeah, I'm pursuing statistics and data science, specializing in the statistics. I'm, I'm also an intern statistician at Nairobi Advent Ensemble Foundation. So I use R in basically my studies and as well as my work. Yeah, so that's me. Which university did you say has Hasselt? Yes, Hasselt University. That's in Kenya? No, 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 that is in Belgium, but um, I'm taking the distance learning program. Anyway, uh, oh, okay. yes. Okay, that's cool. Um, Hi. Oh, Faith, back to you. Sorry, we were introducing ourselves. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's great, that's great. Uh, I don't know if everyone is back. I think I've brought everyone back and I hope you can all see my screen. Um, yeah, so we have to wind things up. Um, thank you so much for joining this. Thank you, Shelmi, for that awesome uh, presentation and taking us through uh, text mining in R. It's a topic many people kind of shy away from because it's deep. I know it's very deep and broad. We are not covered everything, but I, I think. Um, we have a basis uh, and some few concepts we did not know to actually dive deeper into text mining. Um, yeah, and yeah, work on it more and learn about it more. So the tutorial, uh, the GitHub link, uh, the recording, yeah, and all the materials for today will be shared to you before end of today. Uh, so if you have not um, joined our Meetup account or subscribed, uh, or subscribed, sorry, yeah, uh, just uh, joining it. Uh, kindly do that because we email the people on that list. So please do that. And we're going to also share some links on our social media platforms. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the next meetup, which is the last one this year. Um, I, it will be introduction to Shiny app development by a very awesome lady called Lucas Karethi. Um, She's a study design and analysis lead at CC Hub Design Lab. Uh, you can Google that. It's a really awesome lab where they, they do cool things and build platforms and visualize data. On Twitter, she is dr squared. That is d -E -R squared. You can follow and see some of her work. She's amazing. So please don't miss this app. And also, if you've ever been interested in learning Shiny, uh, kindly join and tell your friends so this will be on the 5th of december 2020 from 11 to 2. so you have noticed that we have added an, an hour it's because i know shiny is a bit broad and also it's a special edition because it's the last one this year so we have some special things happening on that day uh to bring the festive mood on and christmas and also say thank you for everyone who will be part of our ladies Nairobi. so yeah we are going to publicize this uh, uh from tomorrow or monday so please uh, reserve uh, on our Meetup uh, platform and purpose to attend uh, this. So yeah, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for I mean, uh, just sharing your thoughts and being here. And I hope that you have met someone or you have known someone that you really know that you can keep networking and grow the R community much wider. 
in Nairobi and also that uh, you have learned something today about text mining or just about R in general because R has so many tricks that not everyone like we don't have we don't know each and every one of that so feel free to yeah look at the recording again share what you have learned invite more people to come and one thing about our ladies Nairobi it's actually not about our ladies so everyone is welcome all the genders are welcome is this a group that uh, tries to bring diversity in the art community, in the programming community, in the data science community, and all that, that tech base of data science in Nairobi uh, by promoting uh, women uh, to be presenters and to also be the organizers. So it's actually open to anyone. Uh, if you know someone or you are someone who uh, would like to present on a topic or you, you, you know something, uh, you know, feel that you feel like you can share the meetup, kindly reach us uh, through all those uh, um, access points that uh, we, have, we have on our screen. Yeah, we, we, have, we need speakers, so kindly just reach out to us and we're going to uh, talk with you and plan a meetup for next year. So thank you so much for this and um, yeah, thank you for joining and thank you for being part of this. Have uh, an awesome weekend. Uh, feel free to leave your feedback on the chat. Uh, I hope we don't have, uh, yeah, I can't see any questions for now. Thank you, thank you so much, Shelmit Masharia, for doing this. Thank you for teaching us so much. Uh, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. We really, really appreciate. And thank you for everyone who joined this. So yeah, so bye. Bye.